Jesus Christ, our Lord, you carry the sins of the world and you forgave the sins of the paralytic. You cured him and had him carry his mat in front of the crowd. Make us worthy to meditate on your amazing miracles and strengthen us with the power of your forgiveness. May we share in the grace of your redemption to glorify and thank you, your Father, and your living Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Peace be with the church and her children. Let us raise glory, honor, and praise to the Father who wished us to share in the mystery of his love, and to the Son who came into the world to heal suffering humanity with the balm of his grace, and to the Holy Spirit who dropped down the dew of his consolation upon broken hearts. To the good one be glory and honor on this blessed Sunday and all the days of our lives and forever. <clears throat> o Christ, the only begotten Son and Word of the Father, you came down to us in your mercy and compassion. You chose to show the extent of your affection and love by telling the paralytic to take up his mat and to walk in the sight of the crowd that all might believe in your divinity. You restored joy to the suffering paralytic and forgave his sins. We thank and praise you for the great gift that you have given to your church. In your name she absolves sins and forgives those who repent. Now, O Christ, our God, we ask you with the fragrance of this incense to extend your mighty hand upon us. Come to us with the power of your forgiveness. Confirm our faith in you and implant in us the memory of your divine miracles and teachings. We glorify and thank you, your Father and your Holy Spirit, now and forever.
Jesus Christ, our Lord, you are the promise of true life, the heavenly physician and the harbor of rest and salvation. Accept our incense and fill us with your divine knowledge. Extend your mighty right hand to cure the sick and suffering among us and heal us with the balm of your forgiveness. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Kadishat <coughs> aloho. church dwells the Spirit flowing from the heart of Christ. Now we ask you, O Savior, pardon us and grant us peace. Reading from the first letter of St. Paul to Timothy. Barach mor aloho dilan. Glory to the Lord of Paul and the Apostles. May the mercy of God descend upon the reader, the listeners, and upon this parish and her children forever. Some men's sins are public, preceding them to judgment but other men's are followed by their sins. Similarly, good works are also public, and even those that are not cannot remain hidden. Those who are under the yoke of slavery must regard their masters as worthy of full respect, so that the name of God and our teaching may not suffer abuse. <clears throat> Those whose masters are believers must not take advantage of them because they are brothers, but must give even better service because those who shall profit from their work are believers and beloved. Teach and urge these things. Whoever teaches something different and does not agree with the sound words of our Lord Jesus Christ and the religious doctrine is conceited, understanding nothing, and has a morbid disposition for arguments and verbal disputes. And from these, 
come envy, rivalry, insults, evil suspicions, and mutual friction among people with corrupted minds who are deprived of the truth, supposing that religion is a means of gain. Praise be to God always. For the proclamation of the gospel of our Savior announcing life for our souls, we offer this incense and ask for your mercy, O Lord. Peace be with you. From the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to St. Mark, who proclaimed life to the world, let us listen to the proclamation of life and salvation for our souls. The evangelist Mark writes, When Jesus returned to Capernaum, after some days, it became known that he was at home. And many gathered together so that there was no longer room for them, not even around the door. And he preached the word to them. They came bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. Unable to get near Jesus because of the crowd, they opened up the roof above him. And after they had broken through, they let down the mat on which the paralytic was lying. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now some of the scribes were sitting there and asking themselves, How does this man speak this way? He is blaspheming. Who but God alone can forgive sins? And Jesus immediately knew in his mind what they were thinking within themselves. And so he said to them, Why are you thinking such things within your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, Your sins are forgiven? Or rather to say, Rise, take up your mat, and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority to forgive sins on earth. And then he said to the paralytic, I say to you, rise, take up your mat, and go home. And he arose, he took up his mat at once, and he went away in the sight of everyone. They were all astounded. And glorified God, saying, We have never seen anything like this. This is the truth, peace be with you.
Some men's sins are manifest, going before them to judgment, and some they follow after. In like manner, also good deeds are manifest. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. So as we come to the juncture at the liturgy now, where we go from our conversion process with the Husoyu, as we've been considering over these last few weeks, and we enter now with the Kaddisha, which everybody likes. There's a former student, uh, a former teacher that I worked with, and he goes to the Maronite church now in Minneapolis, and that was the one thing he singled out. I love the Kaddishat. But in speaking about that, that shifts us to a different next stage in the in liturgical, in the Mass. And before coming to that, I want to talk about the fathers of the desert of what they call Nepsis. Nepsis is part of the fundamental aspect of our spiritual life, obviously practiced by the monks in a very unique way, in a very singular way, separate from those who have to live in the world. But it is also linked by what we've been considering over these last weeks, especially during the week, on the notion of the individual human being being created in the image of the Word incarnate. And of course, Adom, which just can mean a personal name as it does in part in Genesis, but Adom just means man. And so we've also talked about the fact that there are two descriptions of creation of humanity in Genesis. And the first is that Adom is created in the image of God. And it just simply says, and in his image he created them, male and female. So the complementariety of male and female is part of the fundamental creation of humanity and the complementariety of male and female toward one another. But also because in our human life, our lives are always going to be incomplete until we attain that union with our Lord and the full healing of what we are in the image of Christ. And so our lives always are limp along, we're paralytic in that sense, that our lives are being touched by grace, but it's our response in our effort to correspond with that grace that brings that wedding quite literally together between the baptized individual and our divine Lord. That's when we find our health. But of course, this unique relationship that Genesis describes of the image of God, which is specifically and fundamentally male and female, there's always important things for us to remember on this doctrine. We know this, it's in our catechism, it's in the scriptures. But it's important to keep these things in mind because in, we are living through a very convulsive period, culturally, where human nature, gender, sexuality, all these things are being redefined as if they were redefinable and just simply a clean slate that you can write whatever you want on it. The revelation that is given to us is that humanity in the very image of God is that male and female. But in the second portrayal of Genesis' creation of humanity, famously, and this is the one most people know, they don't usually make reference to the first description, but of the reference of Eve being created from Adam's side, from female being created as helpmate from the side of Adam. But there is introduced also into this world by our Lord's appearance, confirming it, this rather unusual isolation of male and female in the monastic life of consecration. These are the individuals who embrace that life already in union with our Lord. It's why we call it the angelic life. We don't call it the angelic life because they're all pure and wonderful and holy. One would hope they are, but it's because they put themselves on a path in which their singular vision in their celibacy, in this consecrated celibacy, consecrated virginity, is this union with our Lord. And to find that healing and to already be an eschatological sign, a sign of the way all of us will be after the day of judgment, at the end of the world. And so this is an important thing for us to understand because 
The complementariety, it's the reason why our Lord elevated matrimony to the level of a sacrament. So that the union of man and woman are not just simply the fact of love and bringing forth children into this world, but even on a more fundamental aspect of mystery is that they are brought together as a restoration of humanity before the fall, so the garden, and a vision of that unity of Christ and his church eschatologically at the end of time. That's why marriage is a sacrament. And it's also why as a Catholic, baptized, consecrated, that consecrated individual can only be wed to another person within the body of Christ, which is why any Catholic who marries outside the church is always considered not married because the consecration is not fulfilled in what they are as individual members of Christ. And so marriage itself, this sacramental union that takes place, is both an extension of, a reflection of, and an extension of, in time, the union between Christ and his church. And that union is precisely the life that actually, the, what we call the crowning, which is why if you haven't seen you know, the Eastern marriages, they are stunningly beautiful. They are about a consecration of this man and this woman to take their place within the mystery of Christ and the church to be its reality individualized within this household, this family, the manifestation of the divine and redemptive action of God for the human race and time. It's also why in the Eastern tradition we see this union of male and female within matrimony as not just simply being there to breed and have children, but that they wind up becoming the focal point in which life, the creative forces of God, are entered into this generation to bring forth life. And not just life, but baptized life. That they raise up not just babies, but they raise up the children of God. That is the vision of what matrimony is. It's the establishment of this mystery of Christ and the church. It becomes the matrix in which divine love, grace, and the outpouring of creative life are vocalized in this generation. That's matrimony. And a number of you I've told, it's one of the reasons why the Russians have a custom in which over the matrimonial bed, and the Romans have a blessing specific for the matrimonial bed. You tell people that and they turn red. Have the priest come over and bless your king size bed. That's exactly what you used to do. But what the Russians do further than that is they hang an icon of our Lord's sacred nativity over the matrimonial bed. Because it's a reminder of that union to bring forth this life of Christ in the world. Because the relations between husband and wife in the Christian church are not just seen in a Hollywood context of emotion and passion, but are seen as the bringing forth of life of Christ in the church. It's a very different vision. But it's all part of this aspect in which we speak about nepsis. Nepsis, that the, what the fathers speak about, we will call spiritual soberness in English. Because what nepsis is, is watchfulness. The attentiveness to our thoughts. The attentiveness to where our minds go. And all we have to do is once we turn off everything in our house, so there isn't the television, the noise, our phones, everything else going, where does my mind go naturally? Where does it flutter around naturally? Unless we have the control over our thoughts, unless we have this nepsis, we can't actually lay the foundation to be able to hear the voice of God because we're distracted. It's why in the monastic life, you see the monks, they have hoods. They focus the mind. For those of you who have known sisters and you've all seen pictures of sisters, they have veils and they wear the veils as part of nepsis and the focus and the control of mind and the control of our thoughts that dispose us to hear. And this is why I wanted to bring it in at this point, because beginning with the Kaddishat and the hearing of the epistle and the gospel, we're listening to the word of God. 
And if we're distracted and fussing around and doing everything or just planning what we're going to do this afternoon, we're not hearing the epistle. We're not hearing the gospel. And so that's why Nepsis is a foundation of our spiritual life. Even living in the world, we have to actually work at mastering our thoughts before we can make any further progress on it. And the concrete thing that I wanted to give you at the end of all of this, because it has come up numerous times, quite hilariously actually, because I've never been in a parish where this has come up so many times in the last four years, and that is head coverings for the women. That within three weeks of me arriving here, all of a sudden for the first time in Walney Parish in 30 years, all of a sudden this is, becomes the topic of discussion at a parish council meeting. It was rather surprising but that's come up several times after that. And of course, last year, when God kind of grabbed the quilt of the world and went foomp and gave it a good shake and everyone's been jumbled all over the place, that when a number of the families started coming from Mass a year ago, a number of the women were wearing head coverings. And the sad part was, is it became a them and us. Oh, those are the conservative. Those are those people from Lewiston. Those are those people who go to the Latin Mass. And who really cares, really? But it brought up a good episode because it's been brought up several times now for me to explain what that is. It's not about conservative or liberal or old-fashioned or newfangled. It's just the question of the apostolic tradition. Remember 111. That's all you have to remember. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And St. Paul talks about the head coverings in the scriptures in the context of his section on the Eucharist and the divine presence of our Lord at Mass. Which is why also I bring it up as we're doing the sermons here, because it will also hopefully just answer the question, because it's not a them and us question, it's an apostolic question which is why your grandmothers, your great-grandmothers, and your mother-grandmothers before that, and why throughout 2,000 years, that prayer veil has always been part of the apostolic tradition from the time that's even before St. Paul writes about it in the first letter to the Corinthians. Because at the end of chapter 11, he just says, and we're not gonna bicker about this anymore, this is the custom of the house of God, period. He ends the chapter, he ends the section speaking about this. So we already know that this took place before. And this is not a cultural norm, which is why some people will say, well, this is just because that's what they did in the classical world. That's not the reason why. Because in the classical world, the men all had their heads covered in the temple. You've seen Jews praying at the Wailing Wall. They all have their blue and white veils. They always cover their head in their prayer. And St. Paul, in that same chapter, says exactly in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, he says very clearly, the men must not cover their head at the Eucharist, must not have their head covered. There's a whole thing that we can wind up developing. You can read the chapter yourself. It is a question about the complementariety of how humanity is created, male and female. That's part of the vision. It is also that St. Paul is talking about this distinct overturning of the law of Moses, which is why the men are not to have any kind of prayer veil on their heads. I mean, as far as a piece of cloth goes, religions all across the world throughout history have always had some form of prayer veil, covering of their heads, forming their spaces. And we mentioned even in Christianity, even with the monks and that, that's what this is. It's not a question of a mantilla. It's not anything specific. It's the question of the head covering. And for St. Paul, when you read the chapter, you will see for him it is also a part of that restoration in the garden of the creation of male and female. And he, when he mentions in the liturgical context in which this is here, is that this is the juncture between the heavenly Jerusalem and the earthly Jerusalem, between the church and the heavenly church, which he gives also as another reason why there are prayer veils. And then finally, what he also winds up saying, as we mentioned, is he says, this is our practice. Remember, the Corinthians were the parish that were always a pain in the butt for St. Paul. And so this became one of those pains. And so in the very first letter that he writes, he writes about it. So we can do as we wish to adopt the apostolic traditions or to simply ignore them and reject them. They've been rejected since the 70s. 
Or we can understand at least that it's apostolic teaching. It is the apostolic church. It is the tradition of the church since the very first generation. And then do as you wish, but just know that you're rejecting an apostolic tradition. That's all to have clarity of thought. It's not conservative. It's not liberal. It's not old fashioned or newfangled. It's just simply the apostolic tradition within the context of the divine Eucharist. In fact, St. Paul says at one point, we have the prayer veils over the heads of the beauty of the women. And it is over the beauty of the women, which he talks about also explicitly, because of the angels because of that divine presence which is present at the liturgy. So, we are all free to do as we wish. The patriarch for a second time has written about our fast, which was quite surprising, but it's meaning that he's being insistent to say this is our ancient traditions. The patriarchal letter this year basically said the same thing he wrote three, four years ago, to remind us these are our traditions. We either cherish them, and pass them on with full understanding and nepsis in control of our thoughts, or we just stumble along, paralyzed ultimately within the Catholic faith because we don't know why we do what we do. And when we don't know what we do, we do so little of it, and what little we do do, we do ignorantly. And that's a very sad situation. So let us ask the fathers of the church to intercede for us to obtain for us nepsis, this spiritual soberness, that in the beauty of the watchfulness and the control of one's thoughts, we each may find our path of light and wisdom in service to the Lord. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten from me, consubstantial with the Father. You live, all things were made for us men and for our salvation. He came down from heaven, and by the Holy Spirit was incarnate to the Virgin Mary and became man. For our sake, he was crucified in a conscious time. He suffered death and was buried, and rose again on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come and give glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is adored and glorified, who has spoken to the Father. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We confess one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, and we look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Itelot madem hain daloho, walwot aloho, rafaletayu, 
Lord and God, you accepted the offerings of our ancestors. Now accept these offerings that your children have brought to you out of their love for you and for your holy name. Shower your spiritual blessings upon them, and in place of their earthly gifts, grant them life and your imperishable kingdom. As we remember our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ and his plan of salvation for us, we recall upon this offering all those who have pleased God from Adam to this day, especially Mary, the Blessed Mother of God, Saint Joseph, her spouse, the Chosen One, our Holy Father, Saint and Mar Saint Mary and Saint Jude. Remember, O God, the children of the Holy Church, our fathers and mothers and our brothers and sisters, both the living and the departed, especially those for whom this sacrifice is offered for the intentions of all the members of this parish. Remember also all those who share with us today in this offering. Continue with the anaphora of St. Peter, Chief of the Apostles, on page 774. 774. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. All 
Father, God of peace and Lord of security, make us worthy to embrace one another with a sincere kiss in the spirit of your unending love, that we may raise glory and thanks to you, to your only Son, and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Peace to you, O holy altar of God. Peace to the holy mysteries placed upon you. Peace to you, O server of the Holy Spirit. Let us give the greeting of peace to our neighbor, love and faith that are pleasing to God. before you to receive your blessings and assistance, for we are weak and you are the support and refuge of all. We raise glory to you, to your only Son, and to your only Spirit, now and forever. Amen. O Lord, may the light of your face shine upon us, deliver us from every evil, and blot out all our transgressions that we may raise glory and thanks to you, to your only Son, and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. The love of God the Father, and the grace of the only begotten Son, and the communion and indwelling of the Holy Spirit, be with you, my brothers and sisters, forever. Let us lift up our thoughts, our minds, and our hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord with reverence and worship him with humility. Right Truly it is right and just to glorify and exalt you, O maker of all creation. With the angels we glorify you and with voices of praise. We cry out and we proclaim. in mercy because of your love for us you sent your son into the world and he became flesh of the Virgin Mary for our salvation Waxoya Bertalmida Kodo Mara Sabahula Mene Kulho Hono Denita Fahoro Dil Dahlo Faikun Wahlov Sagi Metapaseo Meti Heb Husoyan how may we hide on the island, Alami? Amen. 
kanna alko so dom sik ho men hamro ho men mayo bar ho kodesh ya bel tal mi da karo mara sab shta wa mehne kul ho ho no denita demon dil diya ti ki khada to Dahlo faikun wahlav sagiye ete sharu meti hel husoyon haume wa haye dal alam alami amin He then commanded and instructed them saying Each time you celebrate these holy mysteries you remember my death and resurrection until I come again Remember your coming that saved us, and as we await your second coming, we offer you praise and ask you. On the day when you will judge the righteous and sinners, do not condemn us because of our sins, but have compassion and mercy upon us. Turn your holy face away from our sins and assist us. For this, your church implores you, and through you and with you. Implores your father, saying, "Have mercy on us, Almighty Father. Have mercy on us, O Lord. As we, your sinful children, receive your graces, we thank you for them, and because of them, May those who share in these holy mysteries be cleansed body and soul from every sin and receive eternal life. O oh Lord, accept our intercessions and prayers and grant security to your people and peace to your flock. Protect our shepherds, Francis, the Pope of Rome, the Shadow Peter, our Patriarch of Antioch, Gregory John, our Bishop. Assist the priests, the deacons, and all those who serve your Holy Church, so that they may intercede and pray to you on our behalf. We pray to you, O Lord. O Lord. <coughs> Remember, O Lord, those who have asked us to pray for them, those who have desired but were unable to make an offering, and those who assist your holy church. Be a refuge and be a shelter and a refuge for them, for you are the Savior of all. We pray to you, O Lord. Remember, O Lord, the civil leaders in our country and throughout the world. Enlighten their consciences to bring security and peace to your people. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord have mercy. 
Remember, O Lord, the Holy Virgin Mary, Mother of God, and the prophets, apostles, martyrs, and confessors, Saint Joseph and Saint, Saint Jude, and all the saints. Assist us through their prayers and make us worthy of their reward. We pray to you, O Lord. Remember, O Lord, the righteous fathers and teachers who have gone to their rest among the saints. Remember those who diligently carried your gospel throughout the whole world and confirmed your holy church in the true faith. Assist us through their prayers and strengthen us in your love. We pray to you, O Lord. <clears throat> Favor, remember, O Lord, our parents, brothers and sisters, teachers, and all the faithful departed here and everywhere who have gone to their rest. Forgive us and forgive them of all sins and offenses. Through our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ, who is without sin, we hope to find mercy and forgiveness for our sins and for theirs. Grant us pardon, O God, and forgive us and the departed, so that your blessed name may be glorified in us and in all things. With the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and of your living Holy Spirit, now and forever. O God the Father, you strengthen and encourage us, for we are weak. We implore you to purify us from every sin and to accept our offering, so that in one spirit we may call upon you praying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the kingdom of the power and the glory of the Lord. O Lord, lead us not into the trials of temptation that we do not have the strength to overcome, but deliver us from every evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours with your only Son and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Peace be with you. Amen. O Lord, bless your worshipers who bow before you and implore you. Make them worthy of your mercy and forgive all their sins. For you are almighty and rich in compassion. We raise glory and thanks to you, to your only Son and to your Holy Spirit now and forever.
The grace of the Most Holy Trinity, eternal and consubstantial, be with you, my brothers and sisters, forever. Amen. Holy gifts for the holy, with perfection, purity, and sanctity. One Holy Father, one Holy Son, one Holy Spirit, bless the name of the Lord, for he is one in heaven and on earth, to him be glory forever. Make us worthy, O Lord God, so that our bodies may be sanctified by your holy body, and our souls purified by your forgiving blood. May our communion be for the forgiveness of sins and new life. O Lord our God, you be glory.
Again and again we thank you, O Lord, and raise glory to you for giving us your body to eat and your living blood to drink. O lover of all people, have mercy on us.
We thank you, O oh Father, for this gift that you have given us, though we are unworthy. Do not shame us because of our sins, but help and save us, that we may raise glory and thanks to you, to your only Son, and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Peace be with you. <clears throat> Lord Jesus, stretch forth your right hand and bless your people. Protect them by your cross, be their shelter and refuge, and perfect them with your abundant blessings, that we may raise glory and thanks to you, to your blessed Father, and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. So remember that any visiting after to take it outside on the sidewalk, those who wish to remain praying, you're more than welcome to stay. Go in peace, my beloved brothers and sisters, with the nourishment and blessings you have received from the forgiving altar of the Lord. May the blessing of the Most Holy Trinity accompany you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, the one God, to whom be glory forever. <clears throat>